All right, well, look, you've all been good enough to come here on time, so let's get going, partly because this is going around the world as well. Uh, welcome. We're talking uh, today about uh, engaging youth in work, which is an initiative of the Global Shapers, the next generation of business and political leaders uh, around the world. Now, you are not alone. It may seem that there are only about 40 of you in the room, but let me tell you, out there, there are 657,000 reaching on Twitter. In other words, they're aware. We've already had something like 1,200 tweets, and we've had 24.5 million Twitter impressions. And for Shaping Davos, there have already been 157 million impressions. And the important thing about this, and why someone like me is involved in this, is that this is about bringing in the rest of the world beyond the snow and so on to try and engage in a, an important debate like this, which is quite apart from Islamic State and also Russia and so many other issues, and Ebola and the price of oil, youth and work, and where the next generation is going to get its work, whether it should be called work or jobs, and that's what we want to discuss. These are critical issues for stability and equality. Um, let me give you one tweet which we've just had uh, from Fazoranti Damilola. There are no jobs, or they are for the scarce few. Should we all be entrepreneurs now? That's the kind of question which we want to uh, raise this afternoon. And we're going to be joined in a moment by four uh, of the young global shapers or the next generation uh, who are out there. And you can see where they are in Orlando in the United States, in Abuja, uh, in Nigeria, in Chandigarh, north of Delhi, uh, in <coughs> India, and also in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and they are going to uh, inform us about the kind of work that's already been done by a lot of global shapers, and they are just the spokespeople for work that's been done in the last few hours and days, trying to identify the scale of the problem. Let me just give you a, just a few metrics. Young people, especially young women, continue to be disproportionately affected by unemployment across all regions of the world. 74 million young people aged 15 to 24 were looking for work in 2014. And the youth unemployment rate is practically three times higher than for their adult counterparts. And Philip Jennings, General Secretary of the Uni Global Union, just before this, along with Oxfam and the ILO, said that there's a mountain of new evidence that the jobs crisis will uh, continue to deepen as inequality rises. That helping frame this discussion in Davos. And he added, keeping calm and carrying on is simply not an option. So that's what we want to highlight. And let me just bring to your attention what The Economist uh, had a couple of week weeks ago, workers on tap. And let me just help again frame this discussion with a couple of important quotes of the scale of change that is now affecting the work and job prospects. Using the now ubiquitous platform of the smartphone to deliver labor and services in a variety of new ways will challenge many of the fundamental assumptions of the 20th century capitalism from the nature of the firm to the structure of careers. And secondly, the idea that having a good job means being an employee of a particular company is a legacy of a period that stretched from about 1880 to 1980. So it really is about changing mindsets, changing behavior, changing perceptions of the scale of the problem and how it can be addressed. Before we go to the hubs, our experts here in Davos. First, Dominic Barton, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves and the relevance of this to the kind of work you're doing. Uh, my, yeah, my name is Dominic Barton. I'm the Global Managing Director of McKinsey. Uh, we primarily focus on serving uh, industrial companies, governments, uh, and, and NGOs. But one of the biggest issues we think that we're facing in our times is the issue about youth unemployment. Uh, it's something that business needs to be worried about. It's not something that's a sideshow. If we don't deal with it, we're not going to be able to operate in the way we need to. So we need to own it more. And I think with the, as you mentioned in those uh, articles, the changing nature of work and the way technology is moving is going to have some profound implications for us on this. So that's why we're interested. Right. From Kuwait, uh, Omar al -Ghanim. Omar. I'm CEO of Algonim Industries, which is one of the largest privately held companies in the Middle East. Um, 
I've been very involved with youth issues because across the MENA region over the next decade, there's 70 to 90 million incremental jobs that need to be created. And it's a huge issue for us. And we can't rely on the government to be doing it alone. We can't just rely on the incumbent private sector to be doing it. We have to also look at new avenues, entrepreneurship and other things. And I'm very involved with things like that. Aliko Dengoti from Nigeria. Uh, I'm the CEO and Chief Executive of uh, Dangote Group. Uh, in our own group, uh, we employ over 26,000 people. And, uh, you know, we are into various things, cement, uh, you know, petrochemicals, oil, uh, food items. And uh, one of the things that we have several programs of which to generate, uh, you know, employment, of which, you know, I will uh, mention them, uh, you know, later. But. In agriculture alone, we have a target of raise, uh, you know, uh, creating 180,000 jobs, mainly from uh, you know youth in the next three to four years. Thank you. Right, you're going to be our oracles here in Davos, but let's take it right beyond uh, these snows, beyond the mountains, to other parts of the world. And uh, let me go to Chandigarh, which is a wonderful city north of Delhi in India. And let me go to Jyoti Kamal, because Jyoti, I'm just going to remind you what Aaron Jetley, the finance minister, number two in the government, has said today, that India uh, already has a population of 425 million between the ages of 15 and 35. And by the year 2019, 150 million will be first-time voters, and the average age in India will be 29. Tell us about yourself. Well, in fact, we had a very interesting session here today, and uh, talking about myself, I have been observing what's happening in India. It's at a very unique position, in fact, in terms of numbers. It's mind-boggling the number of people who are preparing to go into uh, into into a job scene and the kind of challenges that are facing them in terms of how do they really do it. People want jobs, jobs want people, and yet that fit is not happening somewhere in India. A very unique position for India, for the world, literally, in terms of the sheer force of numbers of Indian youth as they try and kind of get into the workforce, but seriously short in terms of skills, seriously short in terms of what the employers really want from them. They are trying to get educated. Education is facing bottlenecks. There are policy issues. So India really going through a serious challenge. But in terms of a sword, it's a double-edged sword. If India can really pull off with this largest youth base in the world, then it's on the upswing. But if it really doesn't work out, it would spell trouble for India and for the rest of the world. So it's really a very serious issue for India at this point in time. How do you engage youth in work? How do you get them productively involved? All right, Jyoti, that wasn't my question. I was just asking you about yourself. Just explain your own background. Um, and me let me ask you uh, one more time, if you could just slow down a little bit because of the, s the, the, the level of um, uh, the, the bandwidth can't cope with the speed at which you're talking. So just tell us about yourself in 15 seconds, please. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a journalist, so uh, I'm a journalist with a TV network here in India called CNN IPN, and I have been uh, uh, working out of the northern Indian region and watching how things have been happening here, how society is changing. So I'm primarily a journalist. Sorry about that. All right. I will ask you actually to repeat some of that in a moment when we come back and ask you about the detail. Uh, let let me go to Jeddah, to Fatin Bundaji, because you've, uh, as a woman, you've been critical in bringing women's issues uh, to, uh, onto the agenda in Saudi Arabia. Your background quickly, please. Yes, uh, my name is Fatin Bundurji, and I am uh, president of my management consultancy, uh, which focuses on uh, development and youth and women empowerment. Um, I was a former member of the board of directors of the Chamber Chamber of Commerce and Industry and uh, Women Empowerment and uh, Chair of the International Relations Department and the Corporate Social Responsibility. All right, let's go to Orlando in Florida to uh, Carla Redka. Carla. Yes, good morning from Orlando. My name is Carla Radka and I am Vice President of a, the largest organization in Orlando that serves youth at risk. Excellent. And uh, let's go to Abuja now, to Frank Nwecki. Frank. Yes, uh, my name is Frank Nwecki II. And more recently, I was Director General of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, uh, which is a private sector-led think tank and advocacy group. And we've been in the forefront of encouraging government to adopt the uh, um, policies conducive to good governance. Excellent. Okay. Well, well, in the last few months, I've resigned that. Yes. All right. Well, um, 
We'll, we'll pick up on the Nigerian uh, side and the comparison between what you've been doing and the experience of a leading Nigerian uh, industrialist and corporate player here in Davos in a moment. Can I encourage you, if you want to, to uh, send, you've got a bit of paper on your, uh, on your seats, or alternatively, use the strap if you're watching this <coughs> online, uh, send your thoughts to us, because Fatima here is sitting here because she's going to give us some idea already of the kind of reaction beyond this room, particularly from the next generation who are not sitting here in Davos, but are consuming it. And for those who've just arrived, there are literally hundreds of millions of people out there watching this. Now, Fatima, quickly, three or four of the tweets you've been getting to give us an idea of the concerns there are. Well, that's a very hard task because there have been so many good ones. I had a really hard time figuring out which ones to pick. But um, I'll go with the first one from Jumi Adike. She says that, did you know that there are 64 million Nigerians between the ages of 15 to 35? That's the entire population of the UK. Talk about potential. We have another one from Kumar Manish. He asks, how to make youth more employable in the current education system in India? What changes do we need? And finally, from Carolina Parisi from Luxembourg, what are the projects in place to be replicated offering future work perspectives for the youth? All right, Fatima, thank you very much. That's helping us frame the discussion here. Um, now, we've got a number of issues we want brought up by each of the hubs. And just for those of you who've just arrived, each of them is really speaking for a large number of uh, global shapers who've been discussing this issue uh, of uh, unemployment, youth, and particularly the potential and pros prospects. Now, Dominic Barton, give us the consultant's view of how serious this now is with metrics and the potential, both politically and economically, the downside and the upside. Well, uh, maybe I'd just may mention a couple of points. Uh, one, you've already mentioned, it was mentioned before, we're starting from a base of about 75 million youth that are unemployed, and I think that's a conservative number. If we actually look at what being employed is, if we think about uh, full-time, part-time, that number could go up significantly, it can go up to 100 million, but it's at a base level at least of 75 million, and that's around the world, that's everywhere. No country is immune, we're hearing it even in the fast growing countries, India, Nigeria. It's also a case in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's a case in Seattle. Uh, it's all over the world that this is happening. So it's a global phenomenon. I think the second point I would just like to make is that with the move in technology increasing faster and faster, I mean, most uh, CEOs that I see say that technology is moving three to five times faster than management. It's just that the disruptions, the changes, it is having an effect on jobs as well, because how do you keep up with that? And I just want to give one vignette to try and frame it, which at least meant something for my simple mind. If you looked at, I'm sorry to use a US example, but if you looked at Detroit in 1990, the big three, Chrysler, Ford, General Motors, uh, they hired about 1.2 million people. Let me get the numbers right here. They had sales of about $250 billion and a market cap of about 36 billion. The key thing is 1.2 million employees. If you look at the big three in the Silicon Valley today, Facebook, Apple, and Google, uh, they have sales of about 239 billion, billion not that much lower than, than what the, the uh, auto players did. Um, they hire 134,000 people, 1.2 million, 134,000. I think that's quite indicative. A lot of jobs are being displaced. And when we look at the future technology disruptions that are coming uh, with robotics, the Internet of Things, uh, 3D printing, we could go on, we're going to see a lot of automation and disruption, which has been a natural place for people to be able to enter the workforce. So this issue of the 75 million, which is a base level, is going to get a lot worse before it gets better and we're moving. The third comment I just want to make is our our current education system, and I don't want to hammer it too much, but I am going to hammer it, is not fit for purpose around the world. We have either too much of what I call university education that's not training our youth to be able to get jobs. That particularly is the case in Asia, in China, in India. There's a huge need for vocational uh, education. Uh, and, but I would argue that that is also global, if you also look at that in the U.S., in Canada, and Europe. And we've done surveys which show that most of the, uh, on the education side, higher education, 75 percent of people believe they are actually educating the students for work. When you ask employer, employers, 
40% is the highest number that we get. We don't think they're getting the skills they need. And 40% of the students believe that they're getting what they need. So there's a big mismatch that's going on. And what we're finding, and there's some people in the audience here and others, there are now innovations happening in education, the code for a day, uh, eight-week uh, intensive vocational programs to, to help youth get into healthcare-related jobs, uh, web design programs. There's, there's a lot of innovation that's needed, going to be needed to be done. But if we don't change that system, the gap's going to get worse. And that's what I mean about instability. We're going to have a large number of people that don't have jobs. The final thing, and then I'll shut up, is even the nature of work is changing. The idea that we have a job where we go to a place to work, I think, is changing. People are working part-time. If you, Uber would be an example of that, a, a place where you can drive. You don't have you can do it on your own terms and when you want to and where it is. Uh, what we're going to see, I think, a lot more of what I call renting people. That's probably not a very nice word to use, but people are be working in many different environments, and that's going to change when you think about training um, and, on, and, and ongoing support for employees. That's going to be a different world. So we got lots of issues. I, I'm not a Luddite. I, I actually, you know, every time there's a technology disruption, we do find there's new jobs that don't exist that we could never imagine that do come into place. But I don't think we can just assume it's going to happen. So what you're saying is we're charting the landscape pretty effectively, but we don't know how to navigate what lies ahead of us. Yeah, <coughs> and, and I, it's happening so quickly that with this number of people, you know, you've got to be worried. That's, All right. Got to be worried. Okay. Well, look, there are a lot of, there's a lot of expertise in this room as well, and so we want to try and highlight where this can go because already we've got uh, some comments. What are some of the practical solutions to youth unemployment from Hanan Ashkar? Um, starting Monday, what can we change? In other words, there's already a demand out there to know where the solutions might be. Let me go to Jyoti now, to Chandigarh, and please uh, keep using uh, the hashtag uh, which is there um, on your seats. Um, here or out there, if you're watching us anywhere in the world, hashtag shaping work. Let me, Jotty, ask you to repeat what you said earlier, slightly slower, so we can ensure that we pick it up. What has your group in Chandigarh been deciding is the situation, but more importantly, what needs to be done? Well, in fact, uh, the situation that we were talking about today was essentially that there is this huge number that you were also talking about, the sheer numbers that India is adding to its workforce. In fact, almost a million people being added every month to the workforce. Not enough jobs to go around, even as all these people are kind of looking out for jobs, make in India, Narendra Modi now promising 100 million jobs to Indians, the largest youth base in the world. India promises to be a young country now. But the challenge is that while the jobs are looking out for people, while the people are looking out for jobs, there doesn't seem to be the plug-in happening. There's a problem somewhere in between in terms of jobs reaching out to people, people reaching out to jobs. And what we heard today over and over again was in terms of education, in terms of skilling people up, in terms of getting them to get the right skill set. And that's where there were further problems that were highlighted that the education system, which is policy bound, is refusing to change. And it's changing at a very slow pace. But just to give you a short example of the kind of change that people themselves are bringing about, there is a market here in Chandigarh. You go to them with any electronic part, any electronic component that you want repaired, what people there do is they just log on to their computers, open YouTube, watch a how-to video there, and immediately they start sorting out your problem there after watching instructions online. So there is this desire to reskill themselves. They are doing it on their own, but the government seems to be failing them. And that big question is being raised by you, that how do they kind of skill themselves up in a manner that's relevant to industry, industry expressing its frustration in terms of getting the right people there, the onus as of now falling on the government in terms of being able to skill themselves up, uh, skill the youth up. And just to be clear, are, if they go down to the market, are they managed to monetize it? Can they make money out of that? Well, absolutely, they are making uh, they are making money out of it because they are being able to figure out how to work. Uh, I, I would just quickly give you an example of Uber while it's facing its challenges here. There was this whole thing that once technology platforms arrive, maybe people will not get enough jobs. But what it has done is exactly the opposite. Many more people have gone into the business. Many more drivers are now driving using these technology platforms. There is an abundance of cars now. There is an abundance of jobs. So a technology platform has actually enhanced the ability to uh, get, get employment. So that, that 
that's that's uh, that's the advantage of a technology platform. But in terms of higher level skills, there are challenges there, and that's where the opportunity is. That how do you scale up this workforce? Because the industry is growing, the industry is needing the employment, but that's not really coming forth in terms of its availability. Right. Okay. Let's move on to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Fatin, what kind of view was taken by the 60 or so men and women who you have been working with today to try and chart where uh, Saudi and the Gulf will be moving? Uh, well, uh, we, um, we, we identified several challenges, okay, before we went into the solution. Can I talk about that? Well, just tell us about the scale of the problem, and uh, as oh, you scale. need to identify that for those of us here who are not so familiar. Yes. yes, yes. Okay, our biggest problem right now is that Saudi Arabia is facing a very unique, unique demographic uh, in the making. Uh, we have a very large young population, 70% under 30, and 35 of them under 14. So when these people enter the marketplace and get their jobs, there's still another generation coming in. Um, they're not finding jobs. Uh, the education system has not uh, built them to the ability where they can, uh, where there's a mismatch between skills. Uh, the biggest problem that we face right now is we do not have a national strategic policy that uh, uh, focuses on uh, building the capacity of the youth or youth development and on how to integrate them into the public and uh, political life. So what's happening is they're kind of marginalized. Uh, their voices are not heard, and they need validation. Add to that the problem of um, the fact that we are right now kind of in the eye of the hurricane of the political conflict that's going on in the region. And so when you have youth that are not employed, that don't, don't have recreational outlets, uh, they, they, that's room for boredom, room for uh, developing their own form of entertainment. The good thing is, is that they're entering into the volunteer uh, sector. They're uh, trying to create entrepreneurial activity. But on the other side, uh, we have other youths who are going probably, or that would be a risk, to enter the extremist uh, uh, revolution that's taking place. But underpinning all of this is the need for uh, reform. Yes, the government is doing a lot of initiatives to bypass the bureaucratic system. But we need reform at the K-12 schooling system. The kids at that age need to learn life skills. They need to learn uh, ethics, skill behavior, uh, community service. And this is what will build the right mindset, the professionalism, that will create the, the soft skills that's much needed now uh, uh, instead of uh, saving it or trying to work on it once they graduate. All right, uh, we'll come back to you for, for, for further details, although I was about to go to Orlando, and Orlando has disappeared. That's the kind of thing that happens. Uh, let me go, uh, therefore, to get a Q Kuwaiti view from another part of the Gulf. Uh, what, uh, Omar, is your view, uh, not just about the Saudi challenge, but also what you're facing in Kuwait and what you're seeing right around the region, and particularly what it's doing to extremism? Well, you know, I'm, I'm heading up the, the, the WEF's Regional Business Council, and, and we're tackling the, the youth unemployment issue across the, the, the MENA region. Uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, we have a youth bulge, and Fatma, you had mentioned that. We have 60% of our population below the age of 25. So when you have a demographic like that, the jobs, incremental jobs, that need to be created for those people are huge. Um, so it's Should you be talking about jobs or just work or something that could be monetized? Well, I, I think it's, it's finding, finding ways for people to engage in an economy, people to, have an, uh, people to be part of an economy so that they don't become radicalized, so that they don't go off and, and, uh, and, and do silly things. Uh, but people, if they don't feel like they're, they're part of economy and, and participating in that economy, then that doesn't happen. So, but let, I think we have to just take one step back and look at our education system. I think there's a big issue with our education system, and Fatima, you had touched on that. Uh, we don't teach critical thinking. And in a fast-changing world where the technology is shifting so fast, if you just teach somebody how to do a specific skill but not how to think, then as technologies shift, we as a region become unprepared to be able to deal with those fast-changing shifts in technology. So one thing we need to deal with rapidly is addressing the way we teach to, uh, the pedagogical approach to teaching and teaching critical thinking. Uh, and another thing, if you look at how, how those jobs are going to be taken up, you know, in Kuwait, for instance, 93% of the population works for the government. 
that's a stark figure. And I, I don't think there's any other country in the world with that percentage of the population working for the government. So, you know, as you have 60% of the population now below the age of 25, where the government can't take more than 93% of the population. You look at the existing companies, such as ourselves, we have, there's, there's fixed percentages that, that we have to take of nationals. But if those nationals aren't prepared to work within the workforce, it makes your private sector uncompetitive because you're forced to take on people who aren't trained properly. So you really have to, we have to find ways to, to make sure people get trained better right. and for people to be, become entrepreneurs. Because once you become entrepreneurs, your economy becomes more efficient. You, you, you find people out there becoming un, uh, thinking through problems in different ways and, and finding w ways to cross chasms that, that big companies can't. So, um, for example, here's a tweet from Waiswa Batambuze, I think in Africa. Uh, many young people across Africa are un unemployed. Does the solution only lie in entrepreneurship? And that could apply as well to your part of the world. The answer to the question, does it only lie in entrepreneurship? I think a big part of it does, because if you look at the, the, the percentage of SMEs, you look at the percentage of entrepreneurship within our part of the world, it's really, really low. We're in the bottom quartile of ease of doing business. It's incredibly hard to, 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 uh, to tackle the bureaucracy. Also, if you look, we don't have any bankruptcy laws across the MENA region. So if you go out there and you try to start up a business and you fail, there's not only the social stigma of failure, but then you're ta you're, you have years of legal cases on your back because there's no bankruptcy court to help you get out of that situation. So the risk reward as you look towards starting up a business is the, the, the risk is so incredibly high versus the reward. So it's hard to send people to go out there and start up businesses unless you set up the proper legal frameworks to be able to do that. Right, let's go to Abuja because then we can pick up as well with a view uh, from Frank and also from here as well. Frank, uh, what work uh, has your group been doing and what have you identified at a time which is suddenly very different from what it would have been six months ago, suddenly for Nigeria is a critical moment when the oil revenues have fallen so dramatically for your country? Uh, well, absolutely. We had an extremely, um, um, we had a very lively session uh, earlier today. And um, like I said, we had about 120 people participating. And uh, for me personally, it was quite delightful to see the level of enthusiasm amongst these very young people and their keenness to have their voices heard and the sense that they feel that they're a part of um, 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 a, a critical mass of people that need to contribute to finding solutions to the uh, youth unemployment problem in Nigeria. Um, now, I'm just going to go ahead to remind us that Nigeria is a very, uh, has a very huge population, 173 million people, as of 2013. And we're talking about a population that grows at an average of about 3.2% per annum. And so we have a unique demographic in that 35, about 75% of the entire population is below the age of 35. And then in the overall population, you have youth unemployment as high as 40 to 50%. So it's really huge. And clearly, whilst government has worked very hard over the years to try to find uh, work and jobs for these critical mass of young people, uh, it's not succeeded much. And so uh, we believe very strongly that um, the salvation will lie in the hands of these young people. And so in the course of our discussions today, we believe that young people will have to learn to take personal responsibility for themselves a little more. We're not, uh, we're not absolving government and other agencies from the responsibility in this respect, but uh, we believe very strongly that young people in themselves have a huge role to play. Now, one of the things that came across as well is the fact that is the skills gap that exists. So that even, even uh, with the existing jobs, uh, you don't find people who are employable, who have the skills that are needed to fill these jobs. So that's a different problem, which has to do with the curriculum in the schools. And so clearly, the youth also believe that the educational uh, system, uh, the curriculum in particular, will have to be uh, reformed to introduce entrepreneurial studies into the curriculum of schools so that young people begin to learn from a very early stage what needs to be done uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur, and then they become acquainted with it. So by the time they're ready to come out of school, they, they can actually self-employ if they couldn't find the kind of jobs that they require.
All right, Frank, for the moment, thank you. Um, because we're going to go to uh, Aliko Dangote. Uh, you come from Nigeria. I should tell you that while you've been speaking, Frank, uh, the other global shapers sitting, sitting somewhere else have just sent me a message. Loads of youths now go on YouTube, and they learn a trade, which they then end up monetizing. So already we're getting uh, an idea of the kind of answers and solutions that are out there, which are self-generated. What's your perspective on what we've just heard from Frank? Well, my own perspective, yes, you know, what he said, yes, is true, is right. Uh, but, you know, you have to look at it from a different perspective. Uh, what normally people go to university to learn, majority of these things had actually been overtaken by technology. You know, technology really is doing most of these things. So what I think we need to do is create more entrepreneurs and also doing vocational and technical, uh, you know, training. But the numbers are enormous. The challenge is enormous. It can't just be incremental and uh, graduated because of the, the pace at which this is going to confront governments like yours. Well, you know, there, there, there are quite a lot of areas. Uh, I chaired at one point, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, labor committee, you know, job creation committee, you know, created by the government. And I think one of the areas that we did was to look at what are the uh, you know hanging fruits. One of the areas is that when you look at in Africa, for example, we have about 60 percent of the world's arable land, and we are saying that yes, you know they can actually go into uh, agriculture. And one of the things that we alone as a company in Dangote, we rolled out to invest in agriculture. You know where. We gave a program of, uh, we got now about 320,000 hectares in three different, I mean, seven different locations uh, in Nigeria. And with that, we will be able to create these jobs within four, five years in two areas. One is that we realize that Nigeria is importing 97% of the sugar we, uh, you know, we consume. And we're saying that, yes, we have now opened what you call the Ngoti Academy. And we are training engineers and also, you know, uh, technicians, not only for our use, for also people that when they finish, 30% of them should go and find jobs. And we're escalating that to a university level. We have a lot of programs which we are doing, uh, which I believe it will be able to address the uh, problems. I mean, Because uh, the group in, in Abuja has been saying there's got to be a link between this private sector and universities, a much stronger link with the private sector now influencing the curriculum. Well, the private sector, yes, definitely we are going to influence the curriculum of, uh, you know, the uh, universities. Because, for example, yes, they do create, uh, you know, people with degrees, but that's not what we require. And I think it's one of the reasons why we open up an academy and we're escalating it to a university. Uh, because majority of people that we have, even when we take them, they have to go through our academy, which will take them one year before we put them on to, uh, you know, working in our factories and or getting them jobs elsewhere. But do we have jobs? Yes, you know, a lot of people are investing heavily, especially in so many areas in, uh, you know, Africa. There are a lot of investments coming. But sometimes there's a mismatch, which you might not be able to get people to do the kind of work you want them to, uh, you know, to do. Right, well, let's now move uh, to Orlando. Uh, Carla, I hope you can hear me now. We lost you for three or four minutes, but I'd like you to underscore just how difficult this now is for the under 25s, where the unemployment rate is double the national average, and what your group has identified in the last few hours. Yes, uh, so what we have seen in our economy is not only that uh, it definitely needs to be a capacity game. It is a capacity game, and it's important to uh, consider the supply and demand and how uh, educational institutions, vocational, technical, and academic institutions are preparing millennials for the workforce, not only with the necessary skills to be successful and to contribute to our economy, but also to have the values and the character that is necessary to keep the job. Their skills will get them employed, but the character and the values that they bring into the workforce is what is going to keep them employed on the long term. So it is important to definitely focus on sustainability on the long term and to consider the demands of the workplace. And we see more and more careers that are 
evolving and growing on the medical, on the STEM fields, and especially in technology and simulation. Orlando is positioned around the world as a growing economy for medical and technology. And also Orlando is a community that receives uh, individuals from all parts of the world. And uh, so we are very diverse. So it's important to understand the need for cultural competencies and also the need to adapt to a diverse environment, not necessarily just from the aspect of different cultures, from a cultural aspect, but also generational. So it is the responsibility of our employers and of our millennials to understand the differences and celebrate the difference that they bring into the workplace. Thank you. Um, can I just ask, is Alexis Ringwald here? Oh, you're here, I'm sorry. Can I get a microphone here? Because Alexis has got a particular experience in the United States. But Carla, can I just come back to you, particularly for the Hispanic communities uh, and the other uh, communities and the, diff and the difficulties of actually g uh, getting them uh, to be aware of what job or work opportunities there are out there? Because that's one of the issues that was identified by your group. So the need for center for our community in Orlando to have uh, cultural competencies and manuals and information that is available in multiple languages because of the makeup of our community is very real. We have a high population of Spanish speakers, Haitian Creole speakers, and it's necessary to communicate to our communities of uh, our evolving community and our um, uh, residents that either are only Spanish speakers or only Creole speakers about the opportunities that are available in the workplace and opportunities that are available uh, in technical school, vocational schools and academic centers. It is important also to inform youth on the opportunities where they can access education and really use education as an accelerator for their future. All right, and well, it's, def it's definitely a pressing need in our community and uh, something that day by day we continue to work in cultural competency and making opportunities available for minorities. Th thanks, Carla. Um, I want to go to Alexis Ringwald because I met you yesterday and you pointed out some of the work you've been doing in the United States. Can you just, in a very short time, um, you've been spending six months with those who are looking for work and talked about the loneliness and desperation because it seems to me we need to understand the impact that not having work and not having some kind of sense of moving forward does have on the spirit of trying to find a way of getting employed or getting monetized uh, gain. Now, uh, Alexis, in, in literally a, a minute and a half, can you just explain what you discovered? Yeah. Maybe if you could stand up so the camera can see you. I'm Alexis, my company is the 2015 Tech Pioneer. It's called Learn Up. I spent six months in the unemployment lines of America researching why people couldn't find work and concluded that the skills gap is not just a skills gap, but an information gap. And that the way to fix training is, involves three components. We need training that is employer driven it needs to be responsive. We need to constantly update the training dynamically as the job changes. And it needs to be on demand. It needs to be available right when the job is open so that somebody can train and then land themselves in a job. Those are my conclusions after studying this issue and starting our company. But w what, did you, what did you discover as you spent time with the unemployment lines and those who were just looking? That it was just a very depressing experience. You apply and apply and you never hear back and you never know what's wrong and no one will give you any feedback. And it's a communication gap between what employers are looking for and what people keep applying for. What does that tell you, Dominic? Oh, thank you, Alexis. What does that tell you about, if you like, the mindset of those who can actually help move this forward with a degree of understanding of where there's a potential solution? Well, I I think the mindset's a critical one, but I also couldn't agree more with the information gap that's out there. People, most people don't know what jobs are available, and if they do, they, they're out of date in terms of where they are. It turns out, by the way, in the United States, there's three million unfilled jobs, and those jobs are very exciting jobs. They're unfilled. We, and there's, these are, you know, machinists. You may think that's a blue-collar, hard 
core job and what it's a it's a high tech job where we're retiring that group out so there's big mismatches that are going on and I think that's a gap on the mindset one of we've also been doing some work in five countries to try and help generate jobs and we've got a, a big experiment going on in Pittsburgh and it's for nursing assistance and we've got 250 people now that have now been employed it took eight weeks of training most of that training was mindset training interestingly enough mm. it was not about the skill that actually there are skills, it was mindsets. It's about expectations, management, about the importance of coming to work on time. I mean, really some, some basic things. And the Lots level of, of success? Level of 100% of them have been employed. And what we're trying to, that's 250 people, so that's chicken change in the scheme of things. Our, what we need to do is scale it. What we're excited about, though, is employers are the ones that are driving this now. It's not just us, because the ROI of training those people up for eight weeks, they get a lower churn rate of people going through it. It, it's, it, it. it makes employers money to train those people. It's eight weeks, it's not a year and a half. And the other thing I would just say is in, the, in that case, 70% uh, of those people are women that are going into these roles and half of those are single moms, right? They're just, so the, the stories are very, it's emotional because they, they, they are rejected all the time. They have no one supporting them. They have children, part of the reason they can't go to work at times as their ch child gets sick, so it's thinking about the support system. So it, there's a whole ecosystem around it. The, the challenge we have is how to scale it uh, with speed. All right, I'd like to ask, when I come back to the hubs, can you reflect on this, what you're hearing here about mindsets, about capacity, about a new approach, and what we've just heard from Alexis, of the depression and despair that there is. Um, I'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, Fatima, what kind of other responses are we getting at the moment? Well, we, ha we have one from Fasaranti Demilola, who is asking the question, how do we create jobs for youth in rural and conflict areas? And another one from Adham Etum, a gap between education system outputs and skill sets, yet the gap is not filled. Your insights, please. Can you just park that and think about that in a moment? Because I'd like to go to Peya Emerson, because you're involved in a number of prototype schools in developing countries and including Saudi Arabia. What is your experience as you try to do this on a non-profit basis? If you could stand up, uh, well, please, Peya. I think one of the key things is really to know that education is changing rapidly. You know, the disruption is enormous uh, with new technology and uh, the fact that you have all the... Just turn the other way so they can the see you on okay, the television. That you have all the knowledge really on your smartphone. So the role of the teachers, the coaches will be so different. And then as Dominic Barton said, you really have to find ways to get more vocational training and more the kind of skill set that you need in the modern society. At the same time, when I'm looking, I'm also involved in elderly care, where we are trying to get those that have got some kind of handicaps to work in that area. And then you have to reduce compensation levels a bit. And that's one of the major problems. Where do you, how high compensation can you pay? And how many percentage of the population will never get the chance to get the job. And I think there are lots of issues we have to address there, both in education and compensation to get young people into that first job. Just before you sit down, when you hear what Dominic has just said about that eight-week process and the 100% success rate, what are you seeing in terms of the potential model? I think there is enormous potentials if we can get into the right kind of private-public partnerships, because the most of the red tape, that's in the head of politicians and bureaucrats and trade unions. So there are lots of areas where you have to rethink to be able to break new grounds. Thank you very much indeed. Do you want to pick up on any of those points, please? Yeah, <clears throat> on the public-private partnership, uh, you know, our, each region of the world has its own challenges. And us in the MENA region, we have this challenge of trying to get people more involved in private sector entrepreneurship. There's one program that, that I helped to set up across the region, and it's all involved with called Jazz. It's part of junior achievement globally. We now put 400,000 youth through the program annually. And through an independent study that was done, the level of entrepreneurship of youth that go through the program increases fourfold 
ones that go through this program. Because there's, there, there are parts of the, the GCC in particular where there's youth that's both mother, father, uncles, everybody they know works for the government. They don't know anybody that works for the private sector. So when you have two uh, private sector uh, volunteers that go in and spend a semester with these youth, help them start up a company, help them understand what's involved in being part of the private sector, it really becomes a transformational thing, particularly for young women. And that's one, one major challenge that we face across the region. If you look at the gender parity gap that we have across the MENA region, and you compare it to the rest of the developing world, it's three times as large. If it was only two times as large, our GDP would increase by 6%. That would account for a trillion dollars worth of GDP annually. I'm just looking at a couple of things that have come through here, particularly about the poor and those who are going to be victims of not being able to get work. But um, here uh, from Vanessa Delgado, how can we make work or training more accessible for the poor or those who are in debt? And can you uh, maybe address that when I come back to the hubs? Do you have any thoughts, please, uh, from Aliko, about the poor? And you, we heard the 173 million in your country, and we're seeing what's happening in many parts of your country at the moment. It could get much worse with the oil crisis. Yes, well, one of the uh, advantages that uh, we also have, if you look at it today in Nigeria, we have about 18 million housing deficits today and uh, likely we partner with the government where we, you know the government charges uh, you know a, a levy on every ton of cement that we you know took into the country and we've been able to save about 100 million dollars so with this we have rolled out a program you know which is uh, nationwide in Nigeria to say that yes you know if we train you to be a brick Layer, a mason or an electrician or a plumbing person or a carpenter, you already will have a job, you know, because the industry is growing, you know, massively. And, uh, you know, with that, uh, you know, nobody uh, needs to pay for this and he will get the training free of charge. We've just started uh, about two months ago and we have about $100 million. So these are the kind of people that you create, I mean, you create entrepreneurship. They will be there, they have their own this, and they don't have to even go and work for anybody. Uh, but there are quite a lot of this, and some of them will say, okay, fine, but you know, I cannot raise money. And what we did, we have a partnership with Bank of Industry, where we have put down about, uh, you know, 10 billion. They have put down 10 billion. Average, you know, it's about $130 million. They charge 10% and we charge zero percent as Dangote Foundation. So the interest rate average will be five percent, which is very good interest in our kind of society. So with that one, you can also look at it that we can create quite a lot of jobs. This is not only government's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, responsibility, it is also our own responsibility because somebody asked me a question one day that, look, what really keeps you up at night? And I said the level of unemployment that we have, because unless we sort out that, we'll not be able to sort out some of the issues that we have. It's not only in Nigeria, I mean, West Africa. I mean, for example, uh, you know, you have the, uh, a lot of tension in the uh, Middle East. You also have in our own area, you have the Boko Haram. If these youth, they don't really find anything doing, they're tired of sitting at home, they will go to the other side. Either they will be on this side or the other side. Side. So we need to work so hard to keep them out of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, environment. Right. Well, look, we've got about 25 minutes to run. We started five minutes late, and so we'll finish at about five past. Let's now move um, on to the area of trying to work, how, work out how this can be moved forward. What kind of other things are you getting at the moment, Fatima, to help frame this discussion? We got one from Ebenezer Wikina, and it's before we shape work. I think we need to define work. What is work? It's not a salary. It's a calling. Hmm. OK, well, look, let's in the last 25 minutes try and move it forward. We're never going to come to solutions, but pointers as to what the solutions can be. Let me go to Carla, first of all, in, in Orlando, uh, about how to make human capital competitive now. Uh, definitely, the, to make human capital competitive, it is very important to have the skills. Uh, it's very important to consider the demands from employers and to uh, put energy into private, uh, 
public partnerships with employers, with educational institutions, and with the community in general. Community becomes very important to inform, especially the poor, about opportunities for employment and engaging in education and in work. When it comes to the disparities in the educational system, we definitely need to put emphasis on individuals who do not have that easy access to education. Work gives dignity. And I can speak as a founder of a nonprofit that helps with education, Hope Now International. The focus on young individuals to shape that idea of work and that position in community and contribution, I think the mentors played an incredible role. And there is always that call for professionals to really encourage young people, especially young people from minorities or from other parts of the world, to engage in conversations about employment and career plans, to focus on what the future can be shaped and to give hope. And, and because it's, it's very difficult to be unemployed and we are pretty much uh, with a new generation that is the generation most educated in the whole history of the United States. Millennials are graduating from colleges at incredible rates, also graduating with incredible debts. So having a mentor that it can provide direction, guidance, and hope is very important for our youth. Thank you. Um, one comment here from Nimat Kaur, uh, is working from home a more productive strategy for uh, working today, what do companies think about that? Does it just simply save cost? Bear that in mind when I come to you at the end uh, or, or later on in the discussion. But it does raise, if I may just put it to you, Carla, in 30 seconds, please, you use the word employers there. Of course, what we're seeing is new forms of work being generated, as we heard about YouTube, generating new ideas, monetizing it. Everyone's self-employed then. So definitely the workplace is changing and it takes up that opportunity to be agile and adapt to the workplace. Most employers are open to have uh, employees that are uh, you know, from remote locations or they have diverse different jobs and different roles within organizations. I think it takes time to exactly. adapt to the changes but also it's very important to consider that the marketplace is changing and it takes everyone in the landscape of uh, employment to adapt to that change. And it takes many different ways to really learn new skills. Youth might be learning new skills from a YouTube video that they can put in place. If that's the way of learning, especially uh, when young people who are more technology advanced, I think employers need to take advantage of that. All right, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you. Let me just ask our panel here, uh, Dominic, uh, Omar, and Aliko, this word employers, rather like job and work, should we be talking about employers still? Is that still the old mindset, Dominic? Yeah, I think it's very much the old mindset. I think it has to be, you know, you're, you're I think you put it well, participating in the economy. I don't think you need to have, you may, you may be your own employer, if you will, when you're, and I, I come back to this notion Alexis said about information. The, if we can get more information about what needs there are out there, not just from corporates, but even again, what people don't necessarily know they need. And I don't want to keep using belaboring Uber, but it's interesting, it's not displaced taxis, it's actually additive to what taxis are doing. It's actually creating more work, Airbnb, the lodging, there's a lot of people in that, that that's their own work, if you will. And I think we'll find more of that. So this. In, what I think we, what we're, I think a lot of people are saying is we need to be able to take responsibility to be able to find things we do, but we need the information to know where it is, and then most importantly, the education. I go with pay. A, we have a, too much of an aggregated system. Why should it take two years to be able to learn something? Why can't I break that down? And that's where the YouTube, the this coding for a day. There's a lot of. Uh, innovation going on and trying to train people in very specific skills to get them in the system. And I think once you can get in the system and build a base, you can then go from there. But we've, 
we got to be able to get people into the system. Right, let's go around the hubs. Let's keep going to Frank in Abuja. Let me pick up on what, uh, what Peye and also uh, Dominic have just been saying about education. You were talking about it earlier. We were talking about it with you uh, and uh, Aliko uh, about the new relationship with the university systems. But what's your view of your group about how education can help at least minimize or reduce the challenges, even if it can't resolve them? No, absolutely, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely, uh, gentlemen and ladies. I mean, um, there was a very, it was a very, it was a very, very interesting conversation. Even the issue of mindset came up so many times. So it's so interesting to hear that whether it's in Orlando or in Jeddah or even amongst the top panelists uh, with you in Davos, that everyone is converging around that issue of mindset. And so on the matter of education, everyone agrees that it is critical. But one thing I must say is that education is not an end in itself. That is, that, that, I think that's a fact that has been established. And so a lot depends on what happens when you've become educated, right? what you do with it. And that is where the issue of skills then come in. Uh, there's a very interesting system in Germany today where there's a very strong collaboration between the private and the public sectors, where they jointly actually pick up the cost of training Germans who are um, looking to bridge uh, skills gaps um, over a period, either on the job or in, um, in uh, uh, specialized institutions that have been set up for the purpose. Now, I believe that um, that is one way to go, um, to really rejuvenate some of these institutions, which we used to have in Nigeria a long time ago anyway, and then, you know, in the light of 21st century developments, to consider the possibility of having um, um, better, uh, better articulated internship programs uh, amongst existing businesses, and then uh, having people certified for the skills that they acquire during the period. Um, we have a system here called the Industrial Training Fund, which was set up in the 1970s by government to take care of this, but it's become weakened. So I think part of what the Abuja Hub is pushing to do is to see how they can better engage the Industrial Training Fund here in Nigeria to see how we can begin to uh, have better understanding of the skills needs within the private sector in industry, and therefore encourage, um, say, the Nigerian Universities Commission and the curriculum uh, development agencies of government to really uh, work together with the private sector to, um, to, to develop training programs for these skills uh, that are identified within the uh, industrial space. All right, thanks. Uh, let's move on now to uh, both Jeddah and Chandigarh. We've got about 15 minutes, but I want to hear from you where your initiatives uh, are pointing us, or certainly uh, how whatever your group came up with can help some radical rethinking, changing that mindset, which is the word that several of you have picked up on already. Uh, let's go to, to Jeddah, and particularly this idea of the role of women and the, and the, the, the changes that you're seeing. You've been one of the, the pioneers in the vanguard of making sure that the status of women is, is asserted now in the kingdom. How are you seeing this changing? Quickly, please. Um, well, yes, I have to say the last 10 years, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to take off my ears because I, I'm having an echo, so I'll talk from the Okay, speaker. that's fine. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yes. Okay. So, basically, in Saudi Arabia, uh, women's issues in the last 10 years has advanced dramatically. And I think it all has to do mostly and primarily for political will. Um, King Abdullah has been instrumental in bringing the issue of women to the fore. Um, uh, there might have been many reasons for that. We won't go into it now. But uh, we have now uh, parliamentarians. 30% uh, of our parliament is consisting of women. And that, that was really groundbreaking. Uh, women are entering the workforce. Uh, ministries are becoming very aggressive. And, you know, we have a lot of cultural issues here that really do not want women into the workforce. And so we have this dichotomy bet between uh, you know, capitalizing on the return of the investment of our women and listening to the um, uh, conservatives and having women stay at home. So, for example, now the uh, employment of women has risen dramatically, uh, maybe uh, a lot since the Ministry of Labor has imposed upon all companies to employ uh, women salespeople, especially in areas where um, the products are uh, women, uh, clothing uh, and what have you. 
But, you know, I just wanted to talk a bit about the entrepreneurship thing. You know, is it the solution? Um, you know, for you to create the entrepreneurial mindset, it is critical that you uh, give it the proper um, uh, backing. Uh, entrepreneurs have to be creative, have to be risk takers. Uh, they have to have uh, access to funding. So all these structural elements need to be in place because we can create entrepreneurs, but the truth of the matter, at least in my country, is that the startups usually fail after a year or two with a loss and a lot of... Uh, um, how do you say, um, uh, damaged egos, um, uh, because th then they feel that they failed. So we need to have in place, um, uh, I want to also talk about, sorry, the private sector. I think we're at a time in my country where we really have to collaborate. Uh, collaboration, everybody has to share the responsibility of reform, not just the public sector, but also the private sector. The private sector needs to invest in training and development uh, of the youth they employ, uh, now they are mandated to employ uh, youth, uh, Saudi youth. It might be a bit of a hiccup right now, but in the long run, this investment will pay off. And so we have all these issues that are related to, to the general employment of, uh, of, uh, of uh, youth. But for women specifically, we have cultural barriers. Uh, we have a lot of um, restrictions put on the private sector, where if they need to employ youth, they have to have separate uh, or segregated uh, facilities. They need to have uh, crashes for daycare. And this is an added financial burden. So we need to revisit these policies so that we can make it uh, more of an incentive. We need to give incentives to the private sector to employ women. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let me go to Jyoti as well. And can I just put you all on notice in the hubs? I would like to come to you for literally no more than a minute to ask what kind of alert you would like to give to all the politicians and uh, senior business people gathered here in Davos to make them realize just how profoundly challenging this is both for them and the communities uh, and the shareholders that they represent. Uh, Jyoti, uh, let me move forward quickly if you can uh, to your assessment of how decisive you've got a new government for the last eight months. It's likely to be in power for 10 years. I don't want to make too much of a rash political judgment, but they've changed the mindset in your country. How much are they going to be judged by how many jobs or how much work they can somehow facilitate with a new atmosphere created in a country of almost 1.3 billion? Well, Nick, in fact, the big question here is that has the government brought about a change in mindset or has the change in mindset that is happening in India brought about a change in government? In fact, people in India now have access to every sort of communication and are having an exposure of what's best practice in the world and they want it in the country now. In fact, when we were talking about education, one of the major problems in India is that people believe that education is separate from work, that they get done with education at a certain point in time, and then they get into work. And then education never comes back into work. And that's a problem that how do you kind of actually go from education to work, then use your work experience to come back into education. So you in essentially, you bring work experience back into education, then you take it back and forth to upgrade the levels of both. So those are the kind of questions being asked. But in terms of your question as to what is going to be the judgment of the government here in India, people expecting a lot from the government, but it is essentially a bottom-up change that is happening in India. It's a bottom-up change that's going upwards towards the government. The government has to kind of respond to it. It's not a top-down authoritarian system, unlike in some countries where you can impose your will and get things done. So it's a bottom-up movement that's happening in India. A lot of expectations from the government. The government has promised one unique initiative. They say that they are going to have a pool of the best faculty from the top universities across the world, bring them into India, and then loan them out to institutes across India so that the scale killing takes place here. So a lot of uh, initiatives underway now, a lot of challenges for the government. And as uh, Singapore's uh, for, um, uh, pres um, uh, former uh, President uh, Lee Kuan Yew had once said, India is not a single country. It's actually 32 countries joined by the British rail system. It's very challenging, very complex. One major issue is reservation here. People don't have reservation. They want it to be a skill-based thing. They want it to be on merit. So those are the challenges for the government. But as we said earlier, it's a mindset that has changed in India. The government has to live up to it. There are huge expectations from the government as India kind of surges forward with this huge youth base that's the largest that, that the planet has ever seen in, in India right now. Right. Quickly, and then I'll come to the panel. Um, uh, let me go to Carla first. Literally in less than a minute, if you can, 
your message for all the good and the great gathered here when it comes to the enormity of the challenge that you're experiencing and you've analyzed? Definitely uh, for the, uh, we have armies of millennials who are untapped resources in our communities. And uh, the call for politicians, the government, and uh, individuals in power is to create more opportunities, paid internships, education that is accessible to all. Education should not be a matter of privilege. It should be a matter of a right for someone who's interested in learning. Education is the best way to leave poverty. So it's definitely very important to create those channels and those opportunities, especially for minorities and for individuals that come from poverty. Fatin, your view, Fatin, your view from Jeddah, please, about the real message of the enormity which uh, has to be really transmitted to the political and corporate I, leaders I, here. Absolutely. We need, we need to def definitely have a plan in place for the development of youth, a strategy, and we need alignment. Everybody needs to be serious about it, and they need to integrate them in the system and listen to them. Right now, they're marginalized and their voices are not heard. Frank, your view from Abuja. Yes, um, well, my view or our view here is that um, businesses and indeed the entire society um, will continue to be in danger and face ultimate destruction unless we pay attention to this huge segment of our population. Educating them, keeping them healthy, and making sure that they acquire skills. And I believe that um, Mr. Dangote, who is there, has done quite a lot as an individual and in his capacity, in the capacity of his, uh, his uh, company, but he needs to be able to mobilize his colleagues in Nigeria's private sector and then use his considerable influence his government to continue to encourage them to embrace reforms and bring about change. And Jyoti, your view from India, beyond India, but uh, from your position and among the shapers, as you look out, what else is happening in the South Asia and ASEAN region? Well, absolutely. Large numbers of people here moving on, the youth kind of getting into the workforce, a lot of aspirations, a lot of access to digital communication, having instant access to what is best practice. So pressure on the government to move fast. It's no longer time to move slow now because people expect change fast. They want the governments to react fast, and they want to turn it into a pure meritocracy. It shouldn't be bogged down by politics. It shouldn't be bogged down, bogged down by caste, by your class, by your faith. They want it to be a meritocracy. They want the governments to move fast so that they can propel this vast youth base into progressive work employments and, 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 and make it, make it a win-win situation for everyone. Jyoti, thank you, and uh, thank you to all of you for joining us on The Hub. Stay with us. Don't go away. I'm just thanking you at the moment because we're going to have some final comments. But, Fatima, what else is coming in uh, on uh, Twitter? We have a comment from Perez Okezunu. What are the blueprints towards a youth-inclusive economy? And then another one from Zainab Mahmoud. I think education and entrepreneurship are not an either or when it comes to job creation. And the final one from Daniel Abbey, who says that community is important to open access to education and employment opportunities for the poor. Thanks, Fatima. We've had an enormous amount of traffic. And for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, it's running into tens, if not hundreds of thousands. And uh, millions are at least aware of this discussion going on somewhere out there beyond those cameras. Right, let me come back to the three of you here. When you hear that, and I'm going to pick up particularly what Frank said, societies in danger of destruction, which is probably the extreme end of much of what everyone has been saying from the hubs and all the global shapers and other comments from you and elsewhere, but societies in danger of destruction. Now, this is very um, stark language. Do you think that message is understood here, Omar? I, I think that the, the, the enormity of the problem that over the next decade, 70 to 90 million incremental jobs need to be created, uh, that the urgency, I don't, I don't think You're is felt. You're still talking about jobs. Well, the, inc the inclusion into economies. 
that 70 to 90, 70 to 90 million people need to be included into economies and be in inclusive into the economies. That the politicians in our region don't understand the enormity of that problem and don't really see that coming, although the, the numbers are there and it's happening. The private sector leaders don't see that and, and aren't reacting enough to it. I think that everybody should, should really see the enormity of the problem and, and be reacting to it uh, rapidly. Education, but are legal they, frameworks. are they seeing the enormity no, of I, this problem? I, I don't think they are because you don't see the changes being made to legal frameworks, for instance, to allow people to be inclusive into the economies. You don't see the, the changes being made to the education systems to bring in more critical thinking, to give them the skill sets required to be entrepreneurs. Aliko, your view. Do you, well, both in your country but also here and among those you deal with as a corporate leader? Well, my own view is that I think we actually need to be more serious, you know, because we've been talking about this youth unemployment, youth unemployment. We've seen the destruction that they caused in the, uh, you know, uh, you know, North Africa, uh, where you know uh, they topple almost three or four governments. And uh, if you look at it, what we need to do now is to attack this issue on all fronts. Both, I mean, the government, the uh, private sector, the civil society, we need to really say, okay, fine, how do we create jobs? And we follow on both vocational, uh, the, uh, you know, vocational, technical, creating entrepreneurs. Uh, I mean, from where I come from, for example, in Nigeria, we know Nigerians like to work for themselves more than working anywhere else. So it is easier for us to create entrepreneurs but they need also the capital. So there's going to be a lot of reforms, which I believe the government, private sector, civil society will have to sit down and take this in more serious than just a talk show. Dominic, last word. Uh, you're the consultant, you analyze, you're independent, except for those who pay for you, uh, wherever they are, governments or corporates. But I, I say that because you, produce, you take the trouble to produce a lot of uh, documents and analyses which actually you've decided uh, to produce. And when it comes to the enormity of this, societies in danger of destruction, do you think that really is resonating with those who ultimately are the leaders currently in governments and in the corporate world? Well, I, I think what Frank said, I, I agree with that statement, and that it, it is destructive for society. I mean, we know it isn't just the 75 to 90 million not participating in the economy. The New Zealand government did very good work on the cost of someone being unemployed is not just the unemployed person and the, the unemployment insurance and so forth. It, there's crime, there's health issues. I mean, it's a massive, it's the issue you want to get to. So. I think we should start seeing this as a pandemic. What if this was, and forgive me for saying the example, it's probably Ebola and looking at what we would be marshalling the troops like you wouldn't believe. Right now, what it is, and I'm looking in the mirror this way myself too, it's a bit of a cocktail conversation. We can all rattle out 75 million. I'll have another glass of champagne later. Maybe it's 78 million. Should I make clear there's no champagne in this room? I know that. We're being very serious. But I'm just, I'm, I, what I mean is that there's a, there's a sense that we can talk about it, but we all, and I said I'm looking in the mirror when I say it, we have to do something. And the part of the challenge is we're, we're doing this, the education system's not working, the, the, if the youth would just be a little more determined about what they would, and work harder and blah, blah. And I think what we need to do is each of us take responsibility in our, our own way. I think there are an enormous number of really inspiring examples. We've heard some of them earlier this afternoon from this group here. ICICI Bank out in India helping train people on how to do electronics using technology, the agricultural side of things that are going on. So I think we have to womp up the, the commitment to action. I think we've done enough analyzing and we gotta, we've got to move and, it's, and, and we've, we need to take these examples and spread them out as fast as we can, create the incentives to do it. And I think all of us take ownership for, for driving it because I, I think it's a pandemic type problem that we're dealing with. Thanks, Dominic. Um, pandemic, destruction of societies, dangers there. Fatima, one last comment. Yes, that will have to go to Zainab Mahmoud. The smart ones go to university and others get vocational training. Are we getting this wrong if university is not the answer to jobs? 
I think uh, what we may have started off uh, with earlier is a comfort zone of understanding the problem. But as Dominic and all three panelists have said, this is now an urgent problem. But when you talk about a pandemic, and actually many people got Ebola wrong, apart from Médecins Sans Frontières back in March, the World Health Organization said it wasn't going to be an epidemic, as it's turned out to be. Um, it's about thinking the unthinkable here. And the unthinkable perhaps is happening a lot faster than many people and politicians are prepared to acknowledge. But I ask you to take away the issue of mindset, the issue of training, the different kinds of education, the skill shortage, uh, but simply the, number, the numbers that we're talking about and society's in danger of destruction and this word which you've put on the agenda of a pandemic. That is deeply worrying. I fear we're going to be convening again this time next year to discuss exactly the same thing. But what I will do if I'm invited to do it and the global shapers want me back um, is to say, remember what we said a year ago, what has changed, if anything. So thank you very much indeed for being here. And thank you to all of you. Uh, I don't know how many of you are there are, are out there, but I was told 24 million are watching somewhere or at least registering this. I've got one more question for you, Dominic. I'm not going to give you the name, but someone has tweeted, can I get a job at McKinsey without a degree? Yeah, oh, yes, is the answer. <laughs> and I'll give you one other example. I learned Harvard Business School, the former dean, uh, John MacArthur, said they had a, and have a tradition of admitting people without an undergraduate degree into the business degree program. And in 90% of those cases, those people end up in the top 10% of the class. That inspired me in a way. We were too formulaic in what we're looking for. All right, well, to Chandigarh, to Jeddah, to Orlando, to Abuja, and here in Davos, thank you all very much indeed for being with us.